Good morning, Professor Reynolds. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. And I'm going to go over to the students now with the History and Archives Club, who I think have got some questions for you. So, gentlemen, do take it away. Uh, all right, so I think I have the first one. So today we rely on social media and the internet to, for so much of what we know. How would a schoolboy in 1945 would have known about what was happening in Europe? Well, it's a good question. And I think uh, one has to somehow factor out all the things that you are familiar with in talking to your friends and getting information today. Uh, for many families, one of the main sources of information would have been the radio, known as the wireless. And it was quite an event in, in wartime to sit round the wireless for the news bulletins, particularly in the evening. Um, they were from the BBC. BBC had a monopoly of this kind of thing. There weren't any other radio stations. Uh, there were also newspapers, but the newspapers were pretty small compared to what it was like before the war. Uh, maybe you'd have had, you know, 16, 24 pages in a newspaper uh, before the war down to six or even four pages in the wartime because you were having to save paper and newsprint. And there wouldn't be all the things you'd normally have expected, like sport and so on. You know, there wasn't much sport going on. Um, uh, and of course, a lot of this um, was was controlled in some ways by the government, not completely and certainly not as totally as as in 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 Germany, Nazi Germany. But um, the government relied on arrangements with the newspapers not to publish information that was of particular to significance. So, for example, around the time in 1944, a little while before VE Day, your area would have been full of troops preparing for D-Day. And that was the sort of thing that newspapers shouldn't have talked about, even if boys at your school might well have seen a, a lot of troops at that time. So, but they would have, they would have written about those events after they had occurred. So people would have known about what was going on. Yes, I mean, after D-Day, of course, I mean, it's one of the, it was one of the, um, the things that was expected. Everybody knew it was going to happen, but they didn't talk about it in the newspapers. Then there were a lot of backstories, if you like, about what had happened and what was going on. Um, again, within the constraints of, of um, a, uh, a news media that you know, didn't have much, uh, much paper and was still um, trying to avoid anything that could give uh, evidence and information to the enemy. Even, for example, uh, reports about the weather. Those were very important, could be very important to the enemy if they were planning a bombing raid or whatever. So, um, you know, those things had to be, you know, you were always having to watch yourself during wartime. Of course. Thank you very much, sir. Thank um, you. Relating to D-Day, would there have been any noticeable events and occurrences in the weeks leading to VE Day that a schoolboy like us might have seen or known about? Well, one that's quite striking, and I think it relates to the previous question about the media, is um, people got quite a lot from newsreels, which were shown in the cinemas. Now, the cinemas were very popular during the war. There were a lot of feature films that were, were shown. People went to the cinemas for great relief and uh, release. And um, before the, the feature film, they often showed some newsreels. Some of them were very boring, but there's a great story I remember reading by Alan Bennett, um, uh, the playwright uh, who grew up in Yorkshire. And he said, you know, I can remember dozens of feature films I saw in the cinemas during the war. I can only remember one newsreel, but it stuck with me for 50 years. And he said that was the newsreel in April 1945. So just a, a few weeks before VE Day about the liberation of the Nazi concentration camp at Bergen-Belsen by British troops. And that featured on the newsreels. And he said uh, it, it just grew, drew gra gasps of horror, he said, from, from the adults there to see those bodies, to see the, uh, the camp, the squalor, the horror. And it came home to a lot of people what the war had been fought about. You know, what was the moral issue here? That this was a regime that was uh, appallingly evil. And just a few weeks before VA VE Day, I think people got that very clearly from the opening up of the camps. Um, 
Now I have a question about after VE week, um, uh, in the days and weeks after, how much of a change do you think a normal person would see in their everyday life? Well, you know, you, you would sort of expect that it was all going to be different, you know, wonderful, end of the war, all amazing. Actually, what most people would have noticed was that the bacon ration got smaller. Uh, it was already tight during the war. Remember, a lot of the food was rationed. Um, and at the end of May, uh, the government reduced uh, the, um, the ration from four ounces a week to three ounces a week for people, uh, which is you know, a tiny amount in terms of grams, maybe 100 grams or something like that. Um, so the, the, you know, the, the feeling that it was all different is, is, is I think, a mistake to, to assume that. Um, at what they would have noticed most of all was that on the, I think, 23rd of May, the coalition government, which had run the war, Churchill with the, the Labour Party, the li National Liberals uh, working together in the war, that, that coalition government ended. Churchill formed a caretaker government uh, for the next couple of months. And then there was an election on the 5th of July. So pretty quickly, by the time you get to June 1945, we're into election mode and there's a lot of argument between the parties, party political arguments about what should be done in the future. So I think that would have percolated to a lot of people. No, no real changes in your lifestyle straight away, though obviously a sense of relief, but a feeling that there was an election going on. And of course, still the recognition that the war in the Far East had not been ended, not been won. So there was still a a battle going on against the forces of the you know, Japanese military government. So it, it wasn't just everything changed on VE Day. Thank you very much so far. Um, Professor Reynolds, have you got any questions for the students? Or um... Well, I'd, be, I'd just be interested to know, uh, how, did, how, how, did you, how do you feel about this project? Was it something that was really um, surprising the kind of things you found? Uh, what, what sort of headline reactions did you, do you have now about the whole thing? Any of you? Uh, well, personally, oh, should I, can I speak? Yeah. Personally, I thought it was like quite interesting to know about how our school contributed to the war and how uh, tenacious everyone was in England to just yeah. kind of get through it, to help each other, it was very inspirational, actually, to see or to see all that happening. And mm -hmm. I myself am really interested in World War Two. Um, when I heard that we were doing something about VE Day in in History Club, I was just really excited. And I went along every week, and we discovered more and more as the weeks went on. So yeah, it was very interesting. I think that's great, and I think you also, you know, the the way we get into history is often through something that happens locally or to your family, because that captures your personal interest and then you say well in order to understand that I've got to think about this and that and all these other things and so it's almost like you start with something small and you build up to something big the other thing to you know, it's worth keeping in mind here and you must have seen this from your your work is that that war lasted nearly six years now you guys are what 12 13 something yeah. like that so, I mean, the war, in a sense, started when you were around the age of six or seven. Can you remember what you were like then? I mean, you were totally different people, weren't you? It's, you know, it's, it's just something worth remembering how long people had power to be tenacious, had to hang on to this. And although there were high moments, like perhaps the, you know, the, the sense of danger in 1940 or the excitement in 45, you know, 1942 was a really bad year for everybody. You know, the rations had got less. There was no sense that victory was around the corner. People said, you know, it was rather like being right in the middle of a tunnel and you just didn't know where you were, where you were going. So that's part of what I think is interesting. You've mapped out some parts of that story of the war. Some of them may be the most interesting moments. I thought the story about pigs escaping was wonderful. That was a great one. But, you know, there were a lot of days when it was just really boring and really worrying. And maybe, you know, in lockdown, you can appreciate some of that a bit more. You know, we I think we need to bring our own personal experiences to bear in helping to bring history alive. Um, can I add something on to that question? Yeah. 
Um, I sort of enjoyed learning how we, you you sort of see how the schools are completely different. People still got on with their mm. learning, and like we saw pictures of pe- they had they had chess club mm. and assemblies that so there was a sense that it was completely different. But then it was there are you can see a few similarities. Yeah, how they just carried on. Well, I think that's a good point. And in a way, I think as historians, one of the things we're doing is balancing that sense of continuity against the sense of change. You know, what's different in the past? What's similar? You know, and that's something that is is a challenge for any period of history you're studying, that that sort of subtle balance between things being different and things carrying on the same way. And you can get it again by just looking at almost daily life in the way that you've just done at, at your school. Uh, I've just got a quick question um, mm-hmm. regarding schools. Uh, so when um, school boys would have gone to assembly and stuff, would headmasters have said things about the war, or given updates about what was happening? Or would it have been um, not talked about during? No, school? I think I think that assemblies would have dealt with some of the challenges of the war. They were probably some of them would have talked about news items that were particularly significant. I think there would be a lot of attempts to try and um, encourage people to keep morale up and so on. I think it's very striking that your school it was very close to the centre of London. And yet, as far as I understand it, it didn't close during the war. Students weren't evacuated, even though people in the local area, young people in the local area were evacuated. So I think, you know, yours is a very interesting story. And part of the fun of doing historical research is actually that you will discover things that people didn't know about before. You know, research is about finding things that are new. And that, in that way, you add to our knowledge of the Second World War in a different way, a small way, but a significant one. So Keep on digging. That's the way to find out. Professor Reynolds, it has been absolutely fantastic to hear from you. And and boys, your questions too were were super. So really well done. 